Welcome to the Weird Sisters Podcast, your source for Discworld discussion. My name is Manning, and I'm an octopus fisherman. Joining me is Danny, a fishy octopusman. Cthulhu tried to call, but my phone was on silent. Our book this month is Jingo, the story that dares to imagine a world where the police try to prevent racial conflict and war. I don't know quite what I was expecting, since usually when it comes to that sort of thing I only judge by the title. The slang was unfamiliar to me, so I had no idea. I knew it was a watch series book, so I basically already knew I was going to like it, but that was about it. Once again, we have a lot to discuss, so let's chart a course to the trivia section. Published in 1997 and coming in at just under 94,000 words, Jingo is the 21st Discworld novel and the fourth to focus on the City Watch. The title comes from a British exclamation common in the 18th and 19th centuries and has since been conflated with militaristic nationalism. The continent of Clatch, referenced and occasionally depicted in previous Discworld books, is a loose pastiche of the greater Middle East, especially as depicted in media such as Lawrence of Arabia, which this book directly references. There are a few linguistic jokes, the big one being that the Turkish title Effendi, which is used much the same way as the English Sir, is changed to Offendi, as a pun on offensive. The island of Leshp is inspired by Ferdinandia, a.k.a. Julia, a.k.a. Graham Island, a geographical figure in the Mediterranean where volcanic activity created a small landmass that sparked a multi-nation conflict before erosion caused the island to sink back into the sea. Jingo was nominated for the 1998 August Derleth Fantasy Award for Best Novel, ultimately losing to Light Errant by Chaz Brenchley. Jingo has been translated into over a dozen languages, including German, French, Russian, and Spanish. The 2000 audiobook, read by Nigel Planer, lasts 10 hours and 47 minutes, with a three-hour Tony Robinson version released in 2006, one year after Stephen Briggs published a stage adaptation of the story. And, as part of the Watch series, it will likely be incorporated into the BBC adaptation set to premiere in January 2021. The story begins out on the Circle Sea, where two fishing boats are looking for squid. Something to note about this scene, the narration is focused on the viewpoint of one of the fishermen, Solid Jackson, and mentions how he can see the lights of two cities, Al-Kali, the capital city of Clatch, and Ankh-Morpork. Now, in our world, this would mean that the Circle Sea has a diameter of maybe less than 10 kilometers, or 6 miles. Maybe a little wider since it only mentions lights and not buildings. For comparison, the smallest sea on Earth, the Adriatic, has a maximum width of about 200 kilometers, 120 miles. However, my roommate recently mentioned something she learned from the Adventuring Academy podcast. Uh, since our view of the horizon is shaped by the curvature of the Earth, you could theoretically see a lot further on a flat planet, to the point where it would feel like being inside a giant bowl. I've heard that you can see really far if you're out on the plains just looking, or that you can basically take a few steps and chase the sunset for hours, only that's not the area I live in, so I can't imagine that, really. But I, uh, I assume it's a similar effect. The fishermen in the two boats argue briefly about who's hogging all of the squid, but they are interrupted by a -a once-in-a-lifetime tectonic event. The island of Leshp rises out of the sea, reigniting a centuries-old argument about who owns it, Clatch or Ankh-Morpork. In Ankh-Morpork, nationalist tensions are rising, which worries Commander Sam Vimes of the City Watch. As anti-clatch sentiments are shouted in the street, Lord Vetinari, ruler of the city, interviews the various guild leaders about their business dealings with clatch. It turns out that a lot of their income has been training clatchian assassins and selling weapons to Prince Kadram for his campaign to unite the continent. And, as none of that income has been spent paying taxes, Ankh-Morpork has no money with which to raise an army. I was very much not surprised by that. So, as far as the aristocrats are concerned, 
there's only one option. Invoke their ancient right to form private militias in the name of defending the city. At the head of this sentiment is Lord Rust, the head of one of Ankh-Morpork's most prestigious families and decorated veteran of many battles. His name gives pretty good insight, I think, into his skills as a commanding officer. He's rusty. From the start of the book, he's eager to fight, and it makes it very clear that no one really considers what it means to go to war. It's just all for glory. And Rust especially is a man who let the concept of glory just encapsulate him and become his entire self. To me, Lord Rust embodies the cultural glorification of war, with emphasis on the cult. His worship of tradition has eclipsed all rational thought or power of observation. If I took that a step further to speculate, I have to wonder if aristocratic society itself had a hand in that. The only thing that really sets the nobility apart, I think, is their history. And if war was Rust's greatest achievement, that's what he has to flaunt the most in order to maintain a social status. As much as I prefer the overarching story and the less bullheaded characters, Rust kind of took up a lot of my thought while I was reading, which normally wouldn't happen, I don't, I don't think. We see him as rash and enamored with a concept of a them, but he and the other nobles have a lot of influ influence that you only see behind the scenes. A lot of the power they exert happens when our POV characters aren't looking. As the meeting concludes, Vetinari informs Commander Vimes that the younger Prince of Clatch, Prince Kufura, will be arriving the next day to receive an honorary doctorate from the Unseen University. That was the joke doctorate, right? Yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, Captain Carrot Iron Founderson has been turning the city's juvenile street gangs into a Boy Scout troop when he is approached by a recent recruit to the Watch. Constable Reg Shu. For those that missed out on Reaper Man, Reg Shu is a zombie, but more than that, he's an undead rights activist. His relentless enthusiasm is a source of embarrassment for the zombies, vampires, and other differently alive people who he is trying to empower. A gag that makes me wonder if Pratchett was making a statement about real life activist movements with him. Maybe. It's probably highly specific, if so. Like, even I have a pretty hard time trying to see what the point of Reg is, like what stance he was trying to take at the time. I don't have a good way of expressing it, but between Reg Shu and the running gag of the campaign for Equal Heights, mm. it feels like the statement being made there is that people don't need to fight for rights, and that's not great. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that was actually what was being said. In fact, I doubt it, but... But it does kind of come off as mocking a little bit if you look at it that way. Given the rest of the book, though, I doubt that's the case, since he seems to have like such a solid grasp on other very similar concepts, but it just kind of fell flat. Constable Shu has come to get Carrot because Carrot's girlfriend, Corporal Unga, has been taken hostage by a group of burglars, and they need someone to rescue the burglars from the massive wolf that has suddenly appeared. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, I love Angua very, very much, and I'm just really glad that she's settled in more with the Watch now. Like, in, in the past two novels where she's been, where she's featured, it seemed like she's oh, she was a lot more insecure about her place amongst humans or even with the rest of the Watch. I don't know if it's just because we don't see her thoughts that as much this time, but she seems a lot more comfortable. I'd like to say that a large part of that is because she doesn't have to hide, as she doesn't have to hide nearly as much. Both the fact that she's a woman and a werewolf doesn't seem to upset her co-workers anymore, and she hasn't even had to change a thing about herself to do it, which I really appreciate. Like, the sudden drop that it was the burglars who needed help was a really nicely timed joke, and in my opinion, quite an excellent introduction to her character in the novel. It got a happy laugh out of me, at least. <laughs> She's such a nice character, I love her. Elsewhere in the city, Sergeant Colin and Corporal Nobbs are discussing the ongoing political tension, 
and Colin is proclaiming the failings of Clatchians in a way that clearly illustrates his cognitive dissonance and uninformed opinion. I want to take this moment to address a critique I read online about the depiction of racism in this story, specifically as it pertains to this part, where it's suggested that the story frames Colin's prejudice as coming from him being uneducated, or with the line about his schooling being like hearsay and assumptions. While there's some merit to that, I would argue that this scene depicts Colin as being in the wrong not because his facts are off, but because his pride won't let him acknowledge that this is an opportunity to learn. He just feels like he has to have the answer already. I didn't pay very much attention to the concept of pride in this novel, but I do think the comment about hearsay is incredibly valid, though not really as a marker of being uneducated. There are plenty of topics that people just don't think they need to learn about, or they simply just let others fill in the gaps for them. Or if they do know a thing or two about said topics, being continuously battered by rumors can really change a person. What I mean is, I didn't really read that line as a comment on Colin's character, but more as a moment of the story reaching past its own pages to point out extremely clearly that what, quote, they say can't be taken at face value. When I think about it, there's actually a lot in this series about the consequences of separating nameless people into them and us, whether the them are supposedly good or other. And I think that is codified by a line in this story of trying to reconcile the whole idea of them and us and thinking, what if them are us? Yeah, that was um, Vimes with his, his opinions about nobility, right? Because he's, he's a noble now that he's married to Lady Sybil. Yeah, but it's also about racism and everything. Mm-hmm. It does kind of play both sides. Them can mean either another part of the group you consider your yourself with, whether they're, you know, in the right or in the wrong. And then there's those apart from your own group, which is usually the nastier times people use the word them. Elsewhere in the city, we meet Aussie Brunt, introduced only as a lonely weirdo who is fascinated by archery, uh, before the scene changes again. That kind of threw me off, not gonna lie. Okay, who are you? Oh, never mind. Bye. That night, Corporals Nobs and Angua are on patrol together, and he asks her for advice about courting the ladies. <laughs> She stifles her laughter at his mention of doing exercises and makes note of how he dismisses several prospects for not fitting his standard of beauty. All I have written here is, have I mentioned how much I love Angua? <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Nobby would spend a lot of time frequenting r slash incels. Nob's got some good screen time and character development this time around. I really liked seeing that, actually. Because I think before he was just kind of a, a comedy relief that's like, oh yeah, he's kind of cowardly and has to carry around a card that proves he's even human. And he's, <laughs> he's just that guy. He's kind of in the background comedy relief. But now we get to see more of who he is, including all that we've seen before that just we get to see a, another side of him. Past mm -hmm. what we already knew. Meanwhile, Vimes and Carrot are out on patrol and meet up just before someone throws a firebomb through the window of a curry restaurant. The two officers rescue the Clatchian family that owns it, and Vimes realizes that despite being raised in the very insular community of a dwarf mine, Carrot has a far better grasp of Clatchian languages and culture than he, Vimes, has gotten even after living shoulder to shoulder with them for decades. It's an interesting thing, because Vimes clearly wants to be better than the people he sees around him being racist at the Clatchians, and he recognizes how much he has not done how much work he has not put into that and carrot has been very firmly established as seeing essentially everyone as equals except for like his direct superiors in the job uh like vimes or lord veterinari like they're strictly above his station but they're still people to him at the same time he wouldn't have that reservation of not talking to the clatchians and learning about them like he likes to learn about everybody else 
I think you're onto something there, but I'm not sure I would use the word equals so much as friends. Because in the same way that, like, Superman has friends, but I don't think he really considers them equals. Even in, like, the Justice League, he has an ongoing, if rather subtle, character flaw of he decides what the right thing to do is, and if other people don't agree with him, he just does it anyway. And you see a little bit of that, a similar thing with Carrot as well. Yeah, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at is he doesn't have the same biases that normal not normal. That's that's a bad word. He just doesn't have the same biases that the other Ankh-Morporkians have. It's just who he is as a person. He's gives everybody a chance. Although there was that bit in Men at Arms where he was uh, revealed to be prejudiced against the undead. That makes me wonder if what he was expressing there was not his own opinion, but that of especially Vimes. Comparing then to now, Vimes has grown so much in that aspect. I remember in, um, even back in Feet of Clay, he was like, and at the start of this book, he's still surprised by the diversity of people that have joined the Watch already. But he seems to be getting a better handle on that, too. Like, he's really coming to accept that there are so many different kinds of people and that they aren't all what he would think they are without getting to know them. I'm so proud of him. The next morning, Vimes is obliged by the nature of his office to lead the official procession for the Unseen University Convivium. As the wizards and various dignitaries assemble, Vimes meets Prince Kufura, as well as a more sinister-looking man, introduced as 71-hour Ahmed, who chews cloves between his many gold teeth. And carries a very big sword. The interactions they did have with Vimes were, I think, were pretty impactful. They really, uh, Pratchett did a really good job making them stand out from the other times we've seen Vimes interact with the nobility or veterinary or anybody else. They had very, they very clearly had a different take on life. When Vimes was answering Kufura's questions, he did so honestly, and I think he was kind of expecting to have to play the same word games as other nobles. And, but the way he answered more honestly than others ended up getting him more into the prince's favor. Because where, where the others would pretend not to know that people were saying something insulting to the prince to, in, in case he would get angry and seek revenge against, well, anyone at that point, Vimes just told him straight up what the insults meant, and he seemed to appreciate that a lot. Ahmed, on the other hand, I knew I didn't like him just because of his his description he was yeah sinister looking he was described as kind of off-putting not to mention carrying a giant sword but i i definitely did not trust him very correct the procession begins but barely makes it a few hundred yards before vimes gets lost in thoughts about ceremonial armor and the duty of a police officer then he spots something in an upper floor of an abandoned building and takes off running just as the parade dissolves in a chorus of screams. Slight tangent, this whole thing about somebody important getting shot and somebody else running off, and there's a very similar plot line going down in one of the soaps right now, so it's, <laughs> it's pretty funny to see that. There was an interesting point being made on our Discord server about this scene being almost an example of Vimes dissociating. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember I, I commented on that because mental health. Like, I don't really believe that anyone in this story is neurotypical. Yeah, ab absolutely not. Yeah, it definitely did kind of feel like dissociation, now that I think about it. Um, falling back into your own head, especially he had um his focus for his thought was... uh his baton tossing it up in the air and catching it again. It's a very physical kind of grounding motion, as well as the walking. As someone with a proclivity to slip into daydreams, motion can be a really key part of that, like pacing back and forth will help focus the thoughts. So it, it kind of matches up with how he is when he's patrolling. He can just think. The narration, I think, makes it pretty clear that that's what's going on in Vimes' head, is that him walking very much conflated with him patrolling, which is his thinking time. He completely gets distracted, and he actually, like, at one point thinks to himself, oh yeah, there was a parade today, wasn't there? I guess that's why all these people are here. Completely forgetting that he is in the parade right now. And then, basically, what happens anytime Vimes goes to some sort of official event is crime occurs. <laughs> 
which is pretty standard for Ankh Morpork, but this is very bad crime. A Prince Kufra has been shot. He's alive, but seriously injured. In the abandoned building, they find the dead body of Ossie Brunt and a discarded clove. Things not looking good for Ahmed at that point. Vimes reports the body to Vetinari and the Council of City Officials, but in private, Vetinari reveals that he figured out the same thing Vimes did. Ossie was not acting alone. In his standard Vetinari way of knowing things. Vetinari's smart. I like smart characters. He's not psychic, but he can predict the future pretty well. After the meeting, Vetinari slips through a concealed passage and along a booby-trapped corridor to the chamber that houses Leonard of Quirm, the ingenious yet naive inventor whom Vetinari keeps around for much the same reason that a lot of programmers keep rubber ducks on their desks. During the conversation, Leonard mentions that he actually took a few sketches of Leshp several years ago, and it takes Vetinari a couple minutes to realize that Leonard means he visited the island while it was still underwater. See, I didn't catch that the first time. <laughs> uh, like Vetinari, I had to mentally leave the room and then come running back in prime <laughs> comedic fashion, and even then I still didn't catch that he visited it underwater. I was like, Wait, if it only just came to the surface, how would he have known it from several years ago? Is he immortal? An explanation is forthcoming. Yep. No, it's Leonard of Quirm is not actually immortal. Or is he? There's another thing that I did not catch my first time. Partially figured out, partially had to have it explained to me when I was doing research for the book. We'll come back to it. I look forward to that. Back with the watch. While Commander Vimes is having Carrot and Angua figure out what actually happened, Sergeant Colin and Corporal Nobbs are following Ossie Brunt's trail back to his apartment, where they find a stash of clatch money and sand on the floor. They come to the immediate conclusion that Clatchians paid Ozzy to shoot the prince and start a war, which makes Vimes wonder who actually planted that evidence there. Especially the sand bit. He feels insulted by the sand. Th yeah, that was just prejudice. Or it's just assuming that they're all that dumb. To be fair, some of them are that dumb. Yeah. Carrot and Angua conduct an informal investigation, which leads them back to the Unseen University. Also, something I did not catch the first time, Carrot's disguise that he's wearing here is a Mr. Potato Head, like, mustache and glasses. <laughs> yeah, people keep calling him Potato instead of Carrot. Angua, being a werewolf, can smell out where the archer was. Between her nose for detail and Carrot's ability to be friends with everyone, including a grassy knoll, they track down the killer. Get it? That grassy knoll, person shot during a parade. Are you making an Assassin's Creed reference? A Kennedy assassination? Oh. Knolls were mentioned very briefly in a couple early books, but this scene is functionally their formal introduction. While in modern D&D &D, the name refers to a race of anthropomorphic hyenas, Discworld gnolls are functionally walking trash heaps that collect and eat rubbish. There is a similar character in Fraggle Rock who was respected far more. I do actually admire how Carrot can see the usefulness in everyone, and I mean that in a positive way, not a manipulative usefulness kind of way. He mentioned, I think, to Angua that they help keep the streets cleaner than they would be otherwise. Would it be fair to say that Vetinari sees the usefulness of everyone and Carrot sees the virtue in everyone? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a, a better way of putting it. Elsewhere, Sergeant D Detritus, the troll, is preventing a mob from attacking the Clatchian family that was firebombed the previous night, and Vimes has the troll take them into protective custody. But no sooner has that been handled than Corporal Cheery Littlebottom, the Watch's forensics expert, arrives with bad news. The Clatchian embassy is on fire. Vimes rushes in to help rescue some of those trapped inside. Help assisting in the rescue is an unnamed stranger. This whole part was one of the sections that went pretty fast for me. I missed a lot of details. I knew that there was another person there, but I kept thinking that they had mentioned some detail that I missed, but I don't think they really did. Yeah, That sequence of events is a lot more complicated than I just described it there, but uh, that's all you really need to know for just the plot. Yeah, just keeping it accessible for 
anyone who hasn't actually read the book. I, I kept expecting, though, that I would have to go back and reread that scene for some defining detail that would identify the stranger, but I, I couldn't find one. I think it's a deliberately inveigled. Some hours later, Vimes is recovering from his act of heroism and makes the mistake of asking about the time, which activates his disorganizer, basically a fantasy PDA using an imp instead of a computer. I... Want to say that the dis part in Disorganizer is supposed to be like the city of Disc, which is a place in, I want to say Dante's Inferno, as like Dis and Pandemonium are the two cities in hell. Hmm. That might be a bit of a stretch. Yeah, I thought it would have been short for Disc. But that would probably be something that organizes the planet. <laughs> so Vimes and the other officers return to the Watch House so that Carrot and Angua can report on what they found. The second archer the one who actually injured the Clatchian prince, is dead. Vimes barely has time to process this before he is summoned to the patrician's palace, where it is revealed that Vetinari has stepped down. In his place, a war council has convened, with Lord Rust at the helm. Rather than be subject to Rust's authority, Vimes and the other officers step down, just before a delegation from the Clachian Embassy arrives to formally deliver the declaration of war. Huh. Good God, y'all. Vimes returns to Ramkin Manor to talk with his wife, Lady Sybil Ramkin, and does some research on the rules of nobility. As commander of the Watch, he is legally a knight, making him a gentleman and therefore obliged to form a militia one which conveniently consists of most of the named members of the Watch. <laughs> Elsewhere in the city, Sergeant Colin and Corporal Nobbs are clumsily kidnapped by Leonard of Querm and brought to the harbor, where Lord Vetinari is waiting. There, the patrician reveals that he is enlisting the two officers on a top-secret mission. They are going to Clatch using one of Leonard's inventions, a bicycle-powered submarine. <laughs> At least he didn't say it was yellow. <laughs> also, Leonard calling it the boat might be a reference to Das Boot, which is a very famous film. Also, I think I think submarines are just called boats. Probably, yeah. As Ankh Morpork prepares for war, Angua smells 71 Hour Ahmed and the injured Prince Kufra among the many Clachians leaving the city in anticipation of further racial hostility. Suspicious of Ahmed, she sneaks on board disguised as a dog, intending to take a sniff around and return before the boat leaves. However, Ahmed puts a silver studded collar on her, reveals that he knows who she is, and their ship sets sail. Disappointingly, kind of a damsel in distress moment for Angua. A little bit. Like, not quite. Not a not the traditional damsel in distress. Mm -hmm. Back at the watch house, Vimes learns that his disorganizer basically has the ability to protect the future when Carrot arrives with the news of Angua's kidnapping. Vimes takes a minute to think about how weirdly calm Carrot is about all of this before making the decision that he and the Watch Militia are going to chase after her. This leads into one of the book's weirder ideas. The concept of the branching multiverse has been mentioned in a few Discworld stories here and there, and in this one, it plays a pretty significant role. When Vimes decides to leave and pursue Angua, he accidentally trades disorganizers with a parallel version of himself, the net result of which is that he gets a little device that tells him what's happening in the timeline where he decided to stay and try to prevent the war from getting too bad through official means. Yeah, we, we got bits and pieces of that, like all the stuff we really needed to know, but that sort of thing just interests me too much, so I, I do wish we got to hear more about that timeline, how it all fell apart and everything, or how it all went down. The speculation based on the little fragments that we get is far more compelling than anything that would be, than a finalized, definitive take on it would be. True. And, well, this way we get to see, we get more speculation from more people, which leads to more potential stories. I want to know what that Vimes thinks about the things that his disorganizer is saying. Yes. It's been like, I did what now? Vimes commandeers a smuggler's boat and sets sail. Lord Rust, fearing that the Watch Militia will be seen as an invasion, 
decides to invade for real. You know, because that makes sense. Ah, uh, yes, one ship is an invasion. Time to send all the ones we have. Under the Circle Sea, Leonard explains to Navi and Cullen that the submarine has an auger for attaching it to ships, and by luck, they happen to bore a hole into the Clatchian ship, specifically right next to Angua, meaning that she can use the sharp edge of the drill to cut off her collar and escape, hiding somewhere else. She doesn't get onto the submarine, mercifully for her. Oh yes. Vetinari has the sub take a detour to Lesh, where we see that the fishermen from the start of the story are still hanging around, refusing to let the other nation get any more of a claim on the island than they do. Although both groups are deeply unnerved by the strange buildings that populate the island. So don't lie, you thought that this was going to be some sort of Cthulhu thing, right? Yeah. This was the point where I was trying so hard to put together what we knew for whatever end twist there was going to be, but I, I just couldn't do it. I'm like, the buildings are shaped weird. There's a lot of stuff about octopus. What is going on? I think the actual twist is a lot more interesting, really. Mm -hmm. Like, if just Dagon had ri risen out of the ocean and started smashing stuff, that would be... It wouldn't really have brought it home, I think. Wouldn't have said anything. In their pursuit of the Clatchian ship, the Watch toss as much weight off of their boat as they can, which unfortunately includes a lot of stuff that they need for navigation. Vimes comes to regret that decision when a storm blows their boat way off course, and they arrive far down the Clatchian coast. Soon after their arrival, the Watch gets captured by the most fearsome Clatch tribe, of the Duregs, Vimes attempts to outmaneuver them with dirty fighting, but the Duregs fight dirtier, and he gets knocked out. Sometime after Vimes regains consciousness, Angua reunites with the rest of the Watch, and there's a scene with Vimes and Carrot that definitely a statement aimed towards Lawrence of Arabia, where Carrot is rallying various Clatchian tribes into an army, and Vimes emphatically states that the Watch are not soldiers which is something that he's been saying throughout the book. Mm -hmm. They're not. Meanwhile, the submarine has landed safely in Al-Kali, the capital city of Clatch. Nobby and Colon get sent out to steal clothes for themselves and the others in the sub, and Nobby ends up disguised as a lady. <sighs> as Colon bumbles around town trying to get information, Nobby ends up joining a group of women distraught about the coming war, and gets really deep into his character of Betty. <laughs> Betinari has them pretend to be a circus troupe, and wows the crowd with his juggling before the three of them steal a magic carpet and escape. As you do, of course. Good to know he has more hobbies. I says he didn't actually practice juggling, he just understands how to do it, probably because he, as a graduate of the Assassin's Guild, has some like physical dexterity training. And he mentions it's just a matter of knowing where the things are and where you want them to be. So he would be incredibly good at playing platformer games. Yeah. <laughs> now I want to see Veterinary's Twitch streams. <laughs> just speed running. <laughs> He'd play some roguelikes. <laughs> Veterinary might not know what roguelikes are because he gets them the first time. <laughs> Vimes is brought to an abandoned city founded by an Angmorporkian general. There, he is met by 71 Hour Ahmed and figures out the man's true role. He is Al-Khali's chief of police. That was the point where it, it, it just kind of hit pretty hard. I was like, I, I knew the whole book was building up. Like, they are the same. They're different, but they're the same. Just take a look at the, the two fishermen. They're the same, just on opposite sides of the sea. And so now you, you, you could take that same idea and apply it to these two, Vimes and Ahmed. Just like, wow, these two are, they have the same role. They're very much the same in a lot of respects. I, f I think, though, that Ahmed would, would probably do more that Vimes would just simply refuse to. Possibly. I, I got the feeling that Ahmed had more of a, more loyalty than Vimes, in a sense. Because we know that Vimes has been, in the past, like, not afraid to tell Vetinari that, no, I'm not doing that, or that's wrong. Although it usually turned out that Vetinari knew he would do that, so... Yeah. Just played to his own personality. 
During their conversation, Ahmed reveals, one, that he was the stranger helping Vimes rescue people from the fire, and also that the actual mastermind behind the warmongering, especially the attempted assassination of Prince Kufura, is actually Prince Kadram, the older prince. He, Kadram, wants to unify Clatch under his rule, and he plans to do so by starting a war with Ankh Morpork. Nothing like war to bring around the uh, national pride. A couple of the other things, though, that I, I had to say at about this point. I remembered that at the start, they had mentioned that Kadram was, he was the nice prince, and that Kufura was the kind of the laid back, I'd rather go do something fun than be a diplomat. And now here you have the, uh, the prince, the, the nice one, is like, yeah, I'm, I was willing to do this to my brother because I'm supposed to be in charge and I want to be in charge. Although it, it really isn't a very uncommon plot thread, the uh, I'm going to stage a war for reasons, but it really, it works here. It's a simple plot, just made its own unique thing by how the characters function within it, which is a really good statement about how stories work in general. You can take a tried and true format and depending on your how your characters act within that situation, you can make something entirely your own out of it. Together with 71 Hour Ahmed and the Duregs, the Watch makes their way to the battlefield, where Lord Rust has arrived for a diplomatic meeting with Prince Kadram. With no other recourse, Vimes places both armies under arrest for behavior likely to cause a breach of the peace. Oh man. Didn't they say earlier in the book that like you when you arrested somebody it was a lot easier to do it it was a lot easier to do it after a crime had been committed rather than well this person looked like they were about to commit a crime especially when somebody said prove it this is kind of similar except you could prove it it's like yeah i'm just going to arrest most of the city in one go two cities prince kadram dares vimes to enforce the arrest and Vimes levels a crossbow at him. That's about when the Disorganizer chimes in with a report on what is happening in that parallel universe. The Clatchian armies invaded Ankh Morpork, and all of the Watch is dead, including Vimes. Right about then is when Vetinari enters the tent and plucks the arrow out of the crossbow. The patrician has come with a very special package. Earlier in the story, Leonard of Querm had figured out constructing what is functionally a nuclear bomb, and since then, Vetinari has been seen making notes and saying stuff about decisive action, and now we see what that decisive action is. His delivery of a treaty of unconditional surrender to be ratified on Lesp in about a week. So that's what I was talking about with something that I did not really understand what was what was going the first time I read this years ago. I did not know that we were supposed to believe that Vetinari had been building a bomb. I, I had been wondering where the uh, the conversation had been going when he was looking at uh, Leonard's sketches and just noting all the different ways things could be used as weapons and all the different weapons that he had made. Designed, not made. Yeah. Leonard has a talent for making weapons part of that is just that basically anything can be made in, into a weapon or used for warfare and that's something that leonard actually realizes during this story that's like, it's not much of an arc but it is there leonard loses a little bit of his naivete yeah the ankhmor porkians return back across the circle sea by order of the guilds vimes is forced to arrest vetinari and bring him to the palace for an arraignment Lord Rust makes the charge that Vetinari surrendered Ankhmor Park's rights to Lesp, and Vetinari reveals that the island has sunk back down under the sea, meaning that the surrender cannot be ratified and the entire cause of the war has been mitigated. He's just too smart. I mean, he did stop by the island and go underneath it, take a look around. He probably figured out what was going on. It also wouldn't really surprise me if he, he actually had built that bomb and used it to sink Lesp. Vimes returns home to greet Lady Sybil, but is almost immediately summoned back to the palace. This time Sybil comes with him and is delighted when Vitinari makes Vimes the new Duke of Ankh, and persuades him to take the role by promising to build a statue of Vimes' favorite ancestor, Old Stoneface, the one who killed the last king of Ankh Morpork. As the squid of Lesp reclaim their city, the new duke interrupts another formal ceremony to chase after an unlicensed thief, and we 
and the disc turns to a clatchy and night like clatchy and days. <laughs> I was wondering when we were gonna make that reference. <laughs> A Clatchian night is actually cold, cause deserts will not retain heat a lot, or so I've been told. So that was Jingo, what did you think? Oh man, that was fun. It was really fun. I love, I, I love a good mystery. I have made this clear. I, I'm starting to actually really like the Watch series. Like, it's uh, it's pulling its way through to be my favorite uh, subset. You are not in the minority there. <laughs> this, this is going to be an absolute chonker of a discussion section, so please go ahead before I go into my lecture. I didn't have much by way of theory and such. While overall, I like this story. There are a couple places where it falls down, and... Most of these are how it neglects some of the secondary characters. A carrot in the story confused me for a while. It's made clear in the first half of the book that he has a much better grasp of Clatchian culture than any of the other white characters. But then he falls victim to a white savior complex and wants to lead the Duregs against the bad Clatchians. It seems inconsistent, but I think ultimately it's there to underline that the classic fantasy tropes that Carrot embodies are never enough to solve actual problems. Which is uh, all right. Mm. I wish Cheery had gotten to do something interesting. Uh, she's present in the story, but mainly just there to give Vime something he needs to run off and fix. If I was editing this book, I would have actually her and Nobby talk about gender and sexuality stuff. The main benefit to him discussing that with Angua is that it's harder to imagine the two of them getting together. I think Cheery has more standards than Nobby but could actually give some decent insight into learning and coming at the feminine experience. Yeah, her, that was um that was basically her her character arc in uh Feet of Clay was being comfortable with her own femininity, which would have actually yeah, really helped Nobby. More cheery time is better. Yes, I agree. Uh speaking of Angwa, she doesn't get to do that much either. Uh, there's a scene early on where she's frustrated by Carrot not listening to her. But that doesn't really get paid off, and it's pretty much just sitcom levels, drama, comedy. And then she gets damseled just to free herself, mostly on screen, but then we don't see much of her post escaping until she meets up back with the watch, where she doesn't really do much in the finale. It's plot contrivance to get the watch over to Clatch, with just a little dusting of extra character showing that Carrot being by the book and sensible doesn't falter even when his girlfriend is in danger. Yeah, that was when I had uh, a little bit of my introspection about Carrot. So I can I can both agree and disagree with, with that segment. There's a lot of really good points there. And I had a moment similar as well. I, I mostly chalked it up to my idea of what romance should look like, not really being what fit the character's personalities. Carrot, to me, has always felt like he's looking slightly the wrong way and not entirely understanding. But what he's actually doing is looking at everything and processing them equally. And as someone who has a lot of trouble prioritizing, I can really relate to that, even when it comes to relationships, in fact. If I'm not actively with my friends or partner, I, I don't think much of it, and tend to assume they're doing well on their own. So, I like to imagine that Carrot, with his consistent positive attitude, is the same. That he tends to think about Angua fondly, rather than actively missing her, or giving that kind of attention to her. And... Unfortunately, that can really easily come off as being insensitive. I think we've mentioned before that it seems like Carrot is at least coded as also being autistic, especially in the, like, his special interest is the city of Ankh-Morpork. Mm -hmm. And the way he's, the way he acts is, is just really relatable because it, it always seems like he doesn't know how to act the way we'd expect him to in his position. He's been extremely consistent, which is, in my opinion, good writing, with how he acts with everyone in the city and how he can just remember an amazing amount of things about people. If he's, if he's autistic-coded, it for myself, who has some pretty strong ADHD, it really mm -hmm. makes me relate to him. I think he's one of my favorites so far. And also, there's an ongoing question of how much of this is actually him and what is a mask that he's almost wearing. Yeah. But then again, every disguise reveals a little bit about the disguisee. 
Right. I've uh, I've I've told people before, both as various characters and as myself, that the best the best lies have a shred of truth in them. Moving on to more meta narrative stuff, there's the usual troublesome conflation of intelligence and ability to speak clear English. Most notable when seventy one hour Ahmed drops his funny foreigner disguise but also seen when detritus experiences the cold night of the desert. There's at least a little in-text justification from Vetinari, who mentions that Morporkian is the English is like English in our world, uh, lingua franca, which justifies that like a lot of the Clatchian folks being able to speak it, and that 71 Hour Ahmed was educated in Ankh-Morpork. He's a graduate of the Assassin's Guild. Part of me wanted him to say that it was a lingua quermian, uh, to keep the connotations of quirm as Western continental Europe. That would have been a bit of a tangent. Mm-hmm. There aren't too many non-human races in Clatch the way that there are in Ankh-Morpork. I choose to believe that this is because Terry Pratchett wanted to avoid misrepresenting the religions of that region, possibly regretting that he had trodden on similar ground in previous books. Or maybe he just didn't want to repeat himself. Yeah. Uh, Kind of weird because he does repeat himself a fair bit, especially with little snippets of jokes and things. Yeah, and... If he did go into uh, mention non-human races, like even kind of offhand, that would open up a lot, I think, about the difference in culture between Clash and Ankh-Morpork. It, uh, that would, that could open up a, a bit of a can of worms about, you know, one of them being inherently better than the other or not. Okay, big one. Now, I'm not claiming any sort of authority on the depictions of prejudice in fiction, but I do try to listen to others when they talk about it. One complaint I see often enough is that racism analogs are given in-universe justification, such as the disenfranchised group committing some atrocity in the past, when in the real world prejudice is fundamentally irrational. Mm -hmm. I think Pratchett goes to great lengths to illustrate that irrationality here. In fact, it's made cartoonishly explicit with the curious squid fishermen, their identical behavior makes clear that the claims of inherent otherness are entirely unfounded. And if anything, the atrocities that could justify hatred have all been committed by Ankh Morpork, with the references to General Tacitus conquering a large part of Clatch. The other big point about race and fiction that I wanted to bring up here is the discussion about the two main forms of dehumanization, demonization and deification, both of which I feel this story makes admirable attempts to avoid. Not the least of these include references to clutching inventions, such as the number zero, and the fact that they've had telescopes for decades when they've only just been invented in Ankh-Morpork. And 71 Hour Ahmed almost explicitly says not to deify the Clatchians when Vimes first refuses to accept that the war was planned by Prince Kadram. It could not be more obvious that this story wa- wants its reader to challenge simplistic narratives in multiple ways. And in in my opinion, the way it was presented in this book is how it should be done. Uh, we've been getting a lot of media lately about where people have been clamoring to not everything's black and white and you need to show more nuance in your stories. But what that gave us instead was here's all these shades of gray. You have to pick what's right and wrong and live with that. Yeah, well, like compare it to... The sort of stuff you get in, like, Bioware games, for example, where a lot of the attempts at, like, greeting moral gray areas basically boil down to uh, the group that is in the right has individual members who are mean to you. That's, like, a major part of the trying to depict things as morally gray. A lot of characters break character to give sort of middle uh, ground lectures at the player. Yeah, I I'm, I'm think I'm trying to find some way to say that I really liked how this book portrayed there being no real good guy bad guy in this scenario and that that's an assumption you should never make about people because the way that's been seen in more recent media has been taking the moral grayness and making that a positive character trait or a positive story trait and just conflating gritty dark stories and humor with realism when that's simply not the case i mean what does it actually mean to be morally gray Right? And this might be way outside the scope of this podcast. Yeah. 
there's um i think what i'm what i'm trying to talk about is the is the people who will take a character who does some really bad things and say oh they're they're morally gray and you know they're uh like take a character that some people would say is despicable and call them an anti-hero mm-hmm. is what i mean um although like i myself absolutely love a good villain and i love to talk about characters and how they became who they are so like i'm usually down to talk about that sort of thing but sometimes it just goes too far returning to the point i was making uh, the whole concept of recognizing humanity is also present in nobby's subplot where he learns to be less superficial about women i have mixed feelings all the time about uh, cross-dressing especially in comedy where it tends to be very transphobic Mm -hmm. i think the joke here is it's difficult to say uh, to articulate I would say that it doesn't feel transphobic to me necessarily, but I could definitely see, I'd be definitely open to arguments about how it is. To me, I think if a character is going to cross-dress, they should absolutely own it. Uh, Nobby used his experience to grow as a person, which is all you can really ask from somebody if they step out of their their comfort zone. So, with Jingo, uh, there's a clear message of recognizing mutual humanity, and the ultimate victory is not of one culture triumphing over another, but in rejecting the glorification of conquest, which is as much comeuppance as Lord Rust gets. The story makes it clear that he would have suffered a crippling defeat, but it implies that this would not have defeated him the way that preventing the war does. This goes back to my earlier point about him representing the glorification of war, since his contempt for everything except pompous formality is the story saying that no competent leader would seek out conflict. Yet this actually makes him something of an asset, since a competent leader would not have been in the right place at the right time for Vimes to make his big arrest and give Vetinari the moment to step in. So the triumph is not simply of good versus evil, but of decency and intelligence preventing thousands of people from being sacrificed for the ambitions of individuals. At the heart of all this, the message I propose as the thesis of this book is that pride is the greatest source of suffering on levels from individual to international. For Sergeant Colon and Lord Rust, pride is what takes their ignorance from bumbling to harmful. Pride blinds Carrot to the damage he could do as a leader, and Vimes to the true conspiracy. Meanwhile, humility helps Nobby grow as a person, and lets Vatinari achieve the victory through surrender. This whole story, it, it took a really generally simple plot and made it about so many things, both in an obvious way and a not so obvious way, and it, as always, like, tropes got used intentionally tropes got turned on their head and i I just really liked this one it's a very well constructed book Mm -hmm. i'm probably actually going to go back and reread it after this that just about wraps up for this time so i want to remind everyone that if you enjoy the show you can follow us on twitter facebook and tumblr for notifications about when each episode comes out if you'd like to chat with us and other fans of the podcast, you can do so on our Discord server. Uh, speaking of, I'd like to thank Devin from the server for helping out with the favorite footnote poll, since I didn't have a physical copy, and the library ebook I thought didn't include the footnotes and only found out too late that it does. So, egg on my face there. And while I'm thanking people, let's also give a shout out to Willow Carter for our theme music to my co-host here for joining me, and to you for listening. Of course, we save a special thank you each episode to all our patrons on Patreon. Uh, This month, the shout-out goes to Carol, who has just joined us as an official patron. Yay! Thank you, Carol. Next month, we'll be taking a look at 1998's The Last Continent. So I hope you all join us for that. Uh, Danny, care to give us the favorite footnote? Oh, this is the one I had to refrain from alluding to earlier talking about Lord Rust. (laughs) It is a long-cherished tradition among a certain type of military thinker that huge casualties are the main thing. If they're on the other side, then this is a valuable bonus. (laughs) That's all for this month. Until next time, the The turtle turtle moves. moves.